I could listen to that every morning. Thank you. That's beautiful. My name is Ruthann Holmes, and I am the outreach director here at Marshall United Methodist Church. If you are new here or have recently moved, we have connection cards you can fill out to make sure that we have your current information and send you all the important things that are going on here at church. You can also find a link to the connection card at our website, umcmarshall.org. I want to give you an update on the community garden. Isn't it growing beautiful when you pull in and you look? Well, we're busting out some food, aren't we, Bev? She picked some this morning. Some squash was that? Summer squash. Oh, my goodness. That's a beautiful thing. Just over a week ago, we were able to pass out some of the fine harvest from the garden at our fresh food distribution. We had spinach, radishes, oregano, basil, and one jalapeno. No, not on a stick. <laughs> I'm glad you guys get that. We continue uh, to need at least three volunteers per week to help weed water and now begin to harvest from the garden. There is a clipboard at the back of the sanctuary with sign-up sheets for the rest of the summer. Please sign up for any days or weeks that you have available. The Battle Creek Pride Fest and Parade are this weekend. The Pride Parade will begin Friday, July 19th from 7 to 8, and the Pride Fest will be Saturday, July 20th from noon to 8 at Lila Ar Ar Arbitorium. Arbitorium. Arboretum. Why am I seeing Arbitorium? I need to go back to school. If you are interested in volunteering, please contact Pastor Aaron and, and or Kaylee Hill after service today or visit battlecreekpride.org for more information. One last quick announcement. Thank you, first of all, to everybody that came to Pastrami Joe's. I was there for a minute last, it was last Tuesday, and so many familiar faces were there. Thank you so much for coming in and supporting the store There's Enough. We actually made $395 because I got $20 this morning. That's a huge deal. We needed to have at least, I think, like 25 people show up for the proceeds to really kick in, and there was above and beyond that. So thank you. It was actually a lot of fun, and it really helps the store out a lot. Now, if you will please stand for our opening hymn, Number 144 in your hymnals, This Is My Father's World.
Good morning, my name is John Seppinen. I'll be your liturgist this morning. We you please join in our call to worship? Yours will be in bold. There is no God like our God who gives strength to the weak, but breaks the power of the mighty, who gives food to the famished, but makes those already full work for their bread, who raises the poor from the dust, but humbles the proud and arrogant. There is no God like our God. You may be seated. Now join me in prayer. Dear Lord, on any given day, it can be difficult to focus on the words we are about to hear. Perhaps today our heightened sense of awareness due to the recent violence at an outdoor political rally will help us hear with a new sense of interest. Open all our senses to new learning now. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning focuses on Goliath challenging the Israeli army from 1 Samuel chapters 17, verses 4 through 11. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, somewhere between seven feet and nine feet six inches from some of the commentaries I read. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's probably at least 80 pounds. He had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, probably at least 15 pounds. And his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Can I have the kids come down and talk with me for a minute? I see you. Good morning. Oh, good job using your walking feet. Thank you. Hi, Jimmy. It's nice to see you, sir. Good morning, Paul. Hi, Sam. All right, go ahead and take a seat with me. So, boys, how are you? It's nice to see you. Um, this morning, we heard a Bible story about a big, giant man named Goliath. Have you ever heard about Goliath? It's a villain. He's a villain. That's right, Jimmy. Yes. He's a villain because he wants to fight, and he wants to hurt people. Now, do you think that God wants us to fight and hurt people? What does God want us to do? Be kind and loving. A plus. Good job. High five. Kind and loving. Kind and loving wins. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. So, I was wondering, has anyone ever had a fight before? Yes. <gasps> yes, you have. And have you ever used your hands to throw something when you were mad? Have you ever kicked? Have you ever pulled hair? Yeah. Have you ever bit someone? Uh, no, Paul does. Mm, Paul does sometimes. Yeah. Mm, busted. Yeah. Yeah, so these are all things we do when we are fighting. And you know what? It's very hard to deal with our big feelings when we're angry and upset, isn't it? Yeah. 
We like to scream and we like to hit and we like to kick and it's a really hard time. And sometimes it takes us a little bit to calm down, doesn't it? You need to calm down, right? Who sings that song? Michael? (laughs) The answer is actually Taylor Swift. Um, What I want to tell you today is three things you can do if you if you feel like you're gonna fight or if someone is trying to pick a fight with you, okay? This could be related to your own brothers. It could be even related to your classmates at school. It could be on the playground or on your soccer team. It could be on your Lego league. It could be anywhere. You can use these tricks. So the first trick, when someone wants to fight or if you want to fight, Try to walk away. Try to walk away from the problem, walk away from the person who's bothering you. Does that make sense? Okay. Second thing you can do, use your words, not your hands, to tell them how you feel. Say, please stop. I don't like that. Does that make sense? First thing you do, walk away. Second thing, use your words, not your hands. Third thing you can do, you can ask for help, right? You can ask for help from a grown-up or from an older sibling. You can ask for help from a teacher. You can ask for help from a church person, right, church? That's right, yep. So you can walk away. You can use your words, not your hands, and you can ask for help. Now, what do you think would have happened if the villain Goliath would have walked away from the fight or used his words or asked for help. What do you think would have happened? I think it would have made God happy. Yeah, it would have made God happy, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. So can you say a prayer with me today? Great. All right. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for helping us be kind and loving to use our words and not our hands when we are feeling upset. Help us at all times to be like you. Amen. Thank you very much for coming down today. You know what? Maddie just got back from camp, and so we don't have kids' worship today, so you get to stay with me, okay? All right. You You can stay in the sanctuary, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if your dad says it's okay. (laughs) Dad's like, no. (laughs) Okay, you can go to your seat, please. Well, good morning, church. Please hold. Is 
sorry. Hang on. Okay. We're good now. So I'll be honest, church. I'm a little flustered this morning. And I am am amazed by the way that God's Holy Spirit works in our midst to bring the word that we need to hear. For approximately three months, I've been planning to preach this sermon series about conflict, which meant that today was the day we would discuss the most difficult kind of conflict, and that is violence. And... Last night, as I was moving laundry from the washer to the dryer, planning to wear this outfit, as I was getting things ready around the house and printing off my sermon, my phone started to beep with the news of the assassination attempt at former President Donald Trump's political rally in Pennsylvania. And I thought to myself, huh, that's interesting because I'm preaching about violence. And I will tell you that I spent about three hours trying to rework my sermon (laughs) so that it felt relevant, so that it felt timely, so that it felt like an appropriate response for us as United Methodists and people of faith to try to grapple with what happened. I know that this is top of mind for all of you, just as it is for me, and so we're going to do our best today. And we're going to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to be at work in our hearts and minds as we grapple with this difficult topic. So, in our world, we see a lot of violence. And it doesn't always get discussed, right? Sometimes you might be at a restaurant or at a gas station or something, and you watch an interaction between two people that feels harsh or aggressive, and you don't like it, but you're not sure what to do about it. And you might think about it the rest of the day. You might go home and kind of stew on it, but you don't discuss it. There are other times when violence is more extreme, when, there's, when there is um, something that happens in the midst of war, there's something that happens in our city streets, there's something where words that are violent are exchanged. And we take it into our bodies, we take it into our heart and our soul, but we don't always process what happens. And when that happens, our imagination starts to jump to the worst-case scenario of what could happen if this were to be the reality. The other thing that happens with violent offenders is that they are cut off from relationships and society. They are imprisoned for our safety and security. But then... Unfortunately, we don't get to reconcile what happened or share how their actions made us feel. The Bible depicts many stories of violence, and I will name a few of them. There is child abuse, genocide, murder, rape, suicide, theft, tax evasion, and conquests of wartime conflict. The Bible depicts these narratives because the raw realities of human existence are the things that people of faith have always had to grapple with. There are atrocities that have been committed, person against person, nation against nation, tribe against tribe. And folks have had to wrestle with how does my faith fit into this picture? How does the law of God, the law of love, help me to respond as a servant of God, as a servant of Jesus Christ? The reality is that those of us who choose to read the Bible from beginning to end will read these horrors, just as if we are listening to the news in the year 2024. 
And we can certainly relate to violence today, right? If you were to pick up a newspaper, turn on the radio, or click on your television set and turn to a news channel of your choosing, you would see gun violence. You would see hate speech. You would experience road rage. You might hear about someone who committed self-harm or terrorism, or conflicts in faraway places, Africa, Middle East, and the Ukraine. Sometimes we are so inundated by the news of violence that we ourselves start to tune out. We become numb to it because we don't know how to process. We don't know what to do in response to it. There's a feeling of helplessness and paralyzation even fear sometimes to leave our own home. Violence can be so grotesque and monstrous that one way we have dealt with it as a society is to develop cartoons and fictional characters to help us laugh at violence to help us see something else, something foreign and fictional and alien demonstrate violence so that maybe it doesn't actually have to do with us in the end. One of these characters is the Hulk. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Hulk or seen the Hulk. Yes. And in the movie The Hulk, are you ready guys? There is a violent scene in which the Hulk has a problem with one of his co-workers. Enough! You are all of you beneath me! I am a god, you dull creature! And I will not be bullied by that! Puny god. That is referred to as the Hulk smash in the film and in my head when i read the story of david and goliath i picture the hulk the angry grotesque green monster the story that john read for us from the old testament today is about David and Goliath. And David is pictured as this power-hungry narcissist who dares anyone and everyone to come and fight him. You can imagine him banging on his chest and saying, I'm going to win no matter what. I'm the biggest, I'm the strongest, I'm the best. He incites fear in the people. He promises death and ruin. And he totes his victories by counting up his slaves. The hero in this story, of course, is David. David is the underdog who defeats Goliath because David has faith and he has courage and he has God on his side. He's an underdog who rises up into leadership and he ultimately becomes a king. He's a symbol of hope for the people because he's one of the good guys who can defeat evil, who can defeat power, who can defeat hate. I think we want another symbol like David in the midst of our day and time. We want to see the good guys emerge out of the woodwork. We want to see the underdogs have a triumph and a victory. We want to know that good wins over evil and that love wins over hate, right? Are you with me? Violence breaks God's heart. Violence is not what God wants for us. We are to be people of love and service, and our words and actions should help and heal, not hurt. And so for this reason, I'm grateful that in the Bible there are stories Yes, there are stories of child abuse and genocide and murder and rape and tax evasion and war. But there are also good news stories. 
There are stories of hope. There are stories of promise. There are stories of perseverance. In the Hebrew Bible, there's another underdog named Gideon who identifies God as Jehovah Shalom, which is a holy and a hopeful name that comes from the Hebrew language. If I was a person of Jewish faith, I would not even utter the word Jehovah because it is such a holy word. God's very divine presence is so holy that you can't even describe it, you can't even approach it with our human words, our human lexicon. But this name, Jehovah Shalom, means in you, O oh God, there is wholeness, there is healing, there is peace. It means that as we approach God with all that we are, with all that we have, with all the things that we carry on our heart and mind, our best welfare is to be found in God's presence. We pray to God as the God, Jehovah Shalom, and we know that as we come to God, God is always going to be working in our midst, just like God was working in David's midst to bring good in the midst of the bad, to bring hope in the midst of the sorrow, to bring love in the midst of the hate. Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, there are stories about people of faith who are working for change, who are working for healing, and for the healing of the nation. These are the 12 minor prophets, and they're all good guys who are working their hardest each and every day to call for an end to violence. They call for justice to roll down like waters. They call for peace on earth. And when we get to the New Testament, when we get to the Gospels, we see in Luke chapter 2 the story of Jesus' birth that begins to unfold. And this will be a sign for you, we read at Christmas time. You will find a child lapped in, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with them a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace. On earth peace among those whom he favors. In the New Testament, it becomes clear that Jehovah Shalom sent us Jesus the Messiah to come and save the world from sin and death and violence. And the prophet Isaiah, who told this story about a prince of peace that would make all things well, becomes crystal clear by this sweet, loving, gentle baby born to a mother and a willing father. As Jesus grows up and as Jesus enters into his ministry as a rabbi and a teacher, he gives a famous sermon on the mount, and there we find the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes from Matthew 5, where Jesus calls us to be peacemakers. And he says, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who watch an assassination attempt on the news and shake their head and go to bed praying with great fervor about what we are to do about gun violence in America, about political violence, about living our faith in the here and now. One of these questions came up. One of these questions came up in 1944 for a woman named Jill Jackson Miller. Jill Jackson Miller is a songwriter, and she wrote one of our United Methodist hymns, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Let there be peace on earth, then let it begin with me. You know that one? Okay, good. We're going to sing it during communion in a little bit. 
And Jill Jackson Miller wrote this song in 1944, as World War II was in full swing. And she was dealing with some very serious mental health concerns. Jill had attempted suicide, but thanks be to God, was not successful. And as she was in the midst of her recovery and hospitalization and therapy, she was encouraged to put words to her feelings. And for Jill, a musician, that meant to write a song. And as Jill wrestled with the violence of World War II and all the things that she saw and heard in the media, as she wrestled with the violence that was in her heart, the violence that raged against her very self, she said, I knew for the first time that unconditional love exists because God exists and I exist and I am still here. In the midst of my treatment, I have come to understand that I am totally loved, totally accepted, just the way I am. In the moment that I was not allowed to die by the grace of God, something happened to me, which is very difficult to explain. I had an eternal moment of truth in which I knew I was loved and I was here for a purpose. This realization followed and uh, fulfilled Jill in many ways in such that she built her career on trying to help there be peace on earth. She became a political activist in the midst of the 1950s and 60s and 70s. She wrote many songs that were protests of war and that were hopeful and prophetic messages for people who were struggling in body or mind or spirit. Miller's song, Let There Be Peace on Earth, has been shared in all 50 states of the United States, at school graduations, at PTA meetings, at family ho holiday gatherings, on Veterans Day, on Human Rights Day, and United Nations Day. It is sung at 4-H, it is sung at United Auto Workers Union meetings, at the American Legion, and in Congress. Let There Be Peace on Earth has been printed and taped and copied and shared and texted and sung all around the world because of the hope that it proclaims because of the way in which it is a prayer for the healing of the violence that happens between person against person, nation against nation, tribe against tribe. This song, I would like to challenge you today to make this song a prayer, to make it your prayer to make it the prayer that asks us the questions of how can we be peacemakers? How can we respond to one of Jesus' greatest sermons, the Beatitudes? How can we be peacemakers who hunger and thirst for righteousness? And as I ask this question, of course, I will prompt you with some ideas. As we hunger and thirst for righteousness, as we work to be peacemakers, I would like to encourage you to think about how peace begins on the inside and moves out. Peace begins on the inside as we do the hard and internal work of trying to make sense of who we are and who we're called to be and how we respond to the problems in our lives, to the violence in the world, and to the violence that we see. Peace begins with prayer. And so we remember the words of St. Francis's prayer of Assisi. Oh boy. Oh, it's on the back of this one. Lord, make me in an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. 
Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Being an instrument of peace means thinking before we speak. It means building relationships across the aisle. Yes, the aisle in the sanctuary. Yes, the aisle in Congress. Yes, the aisle that exists at the fountain where we see protests happening on a weekly basis. Being a peacemaker and hungering and thirsting for Justice and righteousness means doing the work inside so that we are centered, so that we are rational, so that we are ready to respond with kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Today we'll have an opportunity to come forward to the altar to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion. And this is a place where by our own will and by our own agency, we come forward and we ask God to help us do this internal work. The prayers in the great thanksgiving ask God to transform us from the inside out to shape and mold our very lives by grace. To be people who experience forgiveness and healing and tender mercy, and then are so changed by that that we go out into the world to offer it to others. This is a sacrament where the invisible becomes visible to us, where God's presence becomes tangible to us, where the power of God's presence that is always at work in the world and in our midst becomes seen. In the weirdest way possible, my husband and I were talking about whether or not the stones that David used in a slingshot to defeat Goliath could ever be called a sacrament. Whether or not this ammunition of sorts could be the means of grace for a people that were struggling for a people that were hurting under the oppression of violence, for a people who had been suffering for many, many years, to understand and see where God was leading them and whether it was really to the promised land. And so as David loaded up his slingshot and flung rocks at Goliath, the people began to see that God really is here in our midst, that the underdog really does have power, that we as a people are going to be okay, that this person who is acting on our behalf to bring peace, to bring safety, to bring wholeness, is a person of God. And therefore, in the weirdest way possible, you'll never hear me say this again, a rock becomes a sacrament because of the way in which it helps the people experience God's transforming power and presence in their lives. Does that make any sense? A little bit of sense. Okay, great. I might not use that illustration at 11 o'clock. Full disclosure. I'm also going to number my pages. To be quite honest with you, friends, at, at the end of my sermon manuscript, which is somewhere in this pile... There's, there's, a, there's a line of text that says, wrap it up, preacher, period. And, and the thing of it is, I, I struggle with how to wrap up a sermon on violence because violence is going to be waiting for us as soon as we exit the doors of this church. The world is not at peace. Our relationships are not at peace. 
this community is not at peace. And so the way we're going to wrap it up is with communion. We're going to come forth to the altar. We're going to seek God's grace and God's unconditional love and mercy. And Rob's going to play the hymn that Jill Jackson Miller wrote, Let There Be Peace on Earth. The way we're going to wrap it up is to pray together and to pray that there would be peace on earth and that it would begin with us. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we need you this day. If there was ever a time or a place where we wanted to summon your presence, where we wanted to summon your guidance and your wisdom, where we wanted to lean into your grace and love and comfort and peace, this is the time. Oh God, help us to find your presence in our own lives, to experience it in our body and mind and spirit, so that when we are struggling with our own problems, with our own relationships, with our own illnesses and emotional pain, we would sense you right there. God, just as your son Jesus set a table in the upper room, we pray that our lives would be a place where we could host your presence. Just as Jesus would have put a tablecloth over the altar, we pray that you would drape us and envelop us and surround us with your gifts. May they be the gifts of shalom, the gifts of peace and forgiveness and hope and healing, the gifts of wholeness, so that we might know that you are the one who can make all things well. You are the one who reminds us that it's going to be okay. And you are the one who walks with us until we reach that very place ourselves. God, just as Jesus invited his friends and his followers, the disciples, to the table in the upper room, we receive your invitation today. We receive your invitation to come and feast on these gifts of bread and juice. We receive this invitation to come and unburden ourselves from our anxiety and our fears, our frustrations and our worries, our guilt and our sin. We receive the invitation, O oh God, to come forward heavy and laid down by these burdens and to walk away free and unshackled so that we are ready to serve you in your kingdom, so that we are ready to be the peacemakers your son Jesus called us to be, so that we are ready to show the world that love always wins over hate, that good always wins over evil, and that there is nothing in the heights or depths on heaven or earth or anything else in all of creation that could ever separate us from your love. And so today, as we prepare our hearts to be transformed by this amazing gift of your son Jesus and his presence, we pray that you would come into this space and transform these gifts of bread and juice. Pour out your Holy Spirit here, O oh God. Make us one with the body of Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, so that peace and justice and the righteousness which you have promised will live and reign amongst us now and forever. Amen. Friends, the 
altar table that is set before you belongs not to the United Methodist Church or to Marshall UMC. It belongs to Jesus Christ, and therefore all are invited to come forth to receive these good gifts that we all need and seek as people who long to be transformed. There is... Um, there are gluten-free elements and there are prepackaged elements for those who wish to receive them this day. And if I could have my communion stewards come forward, we will be ready for you. If the kids want to help, you're more than welcome.
Will you pray with me? Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. With God as our Father, brothers and sisters all are we. Let me walk with my brother in perfect harmony. Let me walk with my sister in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow. To take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. And let there be peace on earth. And let it begin with me. Will you join me now in the prayer that the Prince of Peace taught us? Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you have any prayer requests, there are orange cards located inside the black folders in the pews. For those watching us online, leave a comment or visit our website and use the connection card found there. I invite you to join in our morning offering and partner with us in ministry here at Marshall United Methodist Church. You can use our drive up offering box, the donation station at the back of the sanctuary, or you can give online by visiting our webpage, umcmarshall.org. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have been able to worship you. We thank you for the words that we have received. We pray that they may impact each of us. We thank you for the gifts that have been given to this church. We ask your blessing upon them. And we ask that they may, may be used to continue to spread peace across this community, this country, and this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I come to the garden alone. While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet that the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is Yeah. 
I was at peace there. I forgot it was my turn. Friends, as we go out into this week, we give God thanks for the ability to host the Quilts in Bloom quilt show this week. We hosted many, many guests here throughout the weekend and many, many volunteers who worked so hard to make it happen. Thank you, Shirley Cook, for being the leader at the at the Quilt in Bloom Quilt Show was um, very generous enough to include us in their uh, blessing of the church, and they were able to make a gift to our community garden, um, which was a financial donation that we are also very grateful for. As that financial donation comes in, I would like to remind you that your generosity of your time is always a blessing to us. And I need three volunteers this week to help us harvest. Tomatoes are almost ready to help us water and weed. If you can help, please come see me at the back of the sanctuary to sign up on the clipboard. Now we receive this blessing. May the God of grace and the God of glory go with you from this place as you are servants of the Most High, as you are peacemakers, as you manifest the grace and love of Jesus Christ in all that you do. Amen.